Favourite colour? Light blue. <laughs> <laughs> Best kit you've worn? Oof, I liked the green striped one at Wimbledon. Okay. Favourite boots? Mercurial Superfly 4. Wow. Best goal you've ever scored? Oof. Um, I don't know. I scored a half volley when I was at Wimbledon from the corner of the box that should never have gone in. Right. Across the keeper, posting in. Yeah. Uh, um, Either that or the goal for them against MK Dons, that was, that was a good one. <laughs> so I was going to say, next one, most significant moment in your career to date? Scoring the winner at Wembley in the playoff final. What did it mean? Everything. Absolutely everything. I mean, I still watch it back now and, and you get goosebumps. Mm. Um, to see something so significant for the fans and, and yeah, it was just mad, mad, mad day. And it's funny because today is two years since I scored the goal against MK. <laughs> So two year anniversary today. So it's fantastic. I've seen that yeah. that video already on, on social media. <laughs> today, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. We'll look it up later. Um Lyle, so there's an event, we're we're hosting an event on Tuesday, challenging races in football. Where we're bringing the football industry together to talk about a topic that seems to be still to be so taboo. Everyone kind of talks about it in their own little silos, but never wants to come out publicly talk. So there's an opportunity now to bring the game together and discuss. Um, so, firstly, what are, your, what are your thoughts on the current state of racism in football? It's there. Simply put, it's there. Um, in my opinion, will it always be there? Yes. Mm. Um, I've been racially abused when I was in Scotland, been called a coon um, by a, a Dunfermline fan. Um, I've been told to fuck off back to my own country in the last fortnight. Um, I have heard stories from former teammates, mm. um, I've seen it, you see it on the news, you see it everywhere and, and to be honest, do I think we can educate everybody in this country and everybody around the world to the, to the degree that it completely eradicates it? No. Um, you're still going to have bigots, you're still going to have ignorance in the world mm. um, so it's there and it seems to come in in um, fits and starts almost you get one incident and then you get a few incidents mm. and then it dies down and then it comes back and then it dies down again but I don't know I, I see players at the top of the game Raheem Sterling most recently speaking about unconscious bias and, and the way black players are not black players, only black players, but uh, racial, ethnic minorities mm, mm. Are, are treated and it seems to be different. Okay. You mentioned there a couple of times that you have been racially abused yourself and I don't think this question is asked a lot. How do you feel? What's going on in your head when those situations are happening? I mean, when it happened in Scotland, I'd just scored um, and it was a local derby. And uh, if I'm honest, right now I couldn't tell you how I felt at the time mm. because I, I don't remember. It was it was a long time ago now, and I've kind of gone past that. Mm. But with something that happened to me more recently in the last couple of weeks, it hurt, um, and it hurt for more than more than just the the racial connotation or that the, the racial reason. It hurt because of where it had come from, right, and the age of the person it had come from. That's why it hurt so much. Mm. Um, there is, there is only so much we can do as players because we're not allowed to say this, we're not allowed to say that. So there is only so much we can do before we end up getting reprimanded or, or whatever it might be from the governing body of, of our sport. And it is difficult because there is so much we need to say and we should have the power and the, the ability to say it and we can't. It's also very difficult to explain to people who haven't been racially abused how it feels. I mean, it's, it's very different if, if somebody says, oh, 
you you white bastard mm. to if somebody says oh you black bastard it is, mm. is looked on differently mm. and I, I don't know why it's looked on differently I mean if if I was if I was white and somebody called me a white bastard I'd see that as racism mm -hmm. but it's not looked on that, that way and I think that comes from where where we have come from as black people white people have never been they've never been victims of oppression um, so something as almost trivial as that it just gets brushed under the carpet it's water for ducks back mm. but when it's the other way round I think it stirs up what a lot of people have dealt with growing up and I mean you'll know yeah. better than I know when when you grew up it was it was different yeah, it was very worse much so. very a much lot so. worse um, you're trying to say I'm old <laughs> <laughs> no I get you I, I think I think a lot of it just comes from pure ignorance to be honest with you um, you mentioned if you don't mind you mentioned something there where you're saying you know if you talk up too much the game's governing body then kind of reprimands you do you do you not feel that players have a freedom to speak out you know about what's on their mind about the way that they've been victimized you know we had to wait for Raheem Sterling to put out an Instagram post for the game to really react to a situation that had happened on a football pitch only 24, well, less than 24 hours before. So do you think that, that players are held back as such from really saying what they want to say because of the sanctions that they might face? 100%, 100%. If I decided in five minutes time that I wanted to send a message, a tweet or uh, an Instagram post or whatever it was and I decided that I wanted to send that message out, I'd have to be very careful on the language used. Mm. I'd have to be very careful so it didn't come across as disparaging. And I'd have to be very careful that I could effectively not be done for, I suppose, a multitude of things. Mm. Mm. And I think something as emotive and something as bad as racial abuse is, I think there should be almost bendy lines. Okay. We should be able to say what needs to be said and use the language that needs to be used. In a contextual way. In a contextual yeah. way to get the message across. Mm. But I don't think we can. You mentioned social media there. Uh, I know you're on social media, but has that given to the rise of more people who can tap away, talk about you, away from how you play football which is acceptable you know if they're happy with you the way you play football it's great if they're not happy as long as they put it in context that's fine is has that led to the rise of, of hatred and, and racial abuse to be totally honest Let, let's stick to what the topic is 100 percent. it's it's keyboard warriors mm. is it more than that though you say keyboard warriors i know what a keyboard warrior is but i think what they are is people who they would never say it to your face Therefore, they can hide behind the anonymity of uh, an IP address. Mm. Um, some are, I wouldn't say, I, I don't think clever is the right word, but some are clever enough to use fake profiles and fake names and what have you. Some are, let's call them more stupid mm. and will simply do it for their own personal profile mm. and they don't care. Mm. Um, it makes us accessible as sportsmen, sportswomen, whatever we might do, it makes us accessible. And the problem we have with being accessible is that you can't then police what everyone does and says. Mm. Yes, you can have, you can use filters and this, that and the other to, to hide comments using language that, of your choice, mm. you can set those. But setting a filter so that the message isn't seen doesn't, Stop yeah. the message being written and sent. Yeah. So, but, yeah, okay. But, have, have you ever thought of coming off the platform? I, obviously, I did come off of it. Right, I came off the platform for five years. Mm. Um, Why? I didn't like people knowing and and being able to to say whatever they chose to say and knowing what I was doing, when I was doing it and where I was doing it. Um, I didn't like that. I actually only 
started social media again for the charity work I did right, okay. at, at, at the back end of last year for, mm. for cancer research. Um, so that was the only reason I actually started it. And then my agent spoke to me and he said about, about Instagram and Instagram being good because it allows people to see you in a different light. And I said, okay, fine. I said, so I'll go along with that. Um, and I understand it. Mm -hmm. I, I do understand it. I understand why people use social media mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's a good way of, of building your brand. Yeah. And let's be honest, every individual footballer is a brand. Mm -hmm. Regardless whether they've got a clothing brand or whatever they might be, you are a brand. Mm -hmm. You have to sell yourself. Do I feel as a black player I have to do more? 100%. Mm -hmm. Do I have to be seen as squeaky clean? Mm -hmm. 100%. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? The only thing I can bring it back to is unconscious bias. You, do you know what is funny? Because if you go out there and you see a, a young 18 year old kid running around, smashing people, mouthing off, shouting this, that and the other, and he's a white kid, he wears his heart on his sleeve. Mm. If you see a black kid do it, you've got a chip on the shoulder, you've got an attitude problem. Mm. Now, I was told when I was younger I had an attitude problem. Did I have an attitude problem? I wouldn't say I did. Mm. I'd say I was the same person now as I was back then. Mm. Maybe a little bit smarter. Yeah. But I said what I felt. You can't say what you feel. Mm. I, I've got a, a, a sports psychologist and he said to me, he said, you have to have skin in the game. Now you'll understand what that means. You, mm. have, to, you have to have credit yeah. before you, before as, you a, as a black player, can say what you feel you need to say. Mm. I've earned my stripes now. I can walk into the dressing room and I can voice my opinion and nobody can come back at me and say anything because I've earned the right to have that opinion. Mm. As, a, as a young black man, I didn't have the ability or the capability of having that opinion. Mm. Mm. You, you chose to spoke about you now. Was the young Lyle Taylor as opinionated but in a different way, or have you learnt that as you've grown? You've mentioned get earning your stripes, but for me, you're in this game. You've got your stripes, you know, because there's so many people that want to be in a position like yours. But was the young Lyle Taylor the same? The young Lyle Taylor didn't have a filter. Um, if I felt that I wanted to say it, I'd say it. I am <clears throat> a little bit better now. I mean. I've still said things that I shouldn't have said and spoken out of turn um, and been pulled up for that. Mm. And I accept that, that yeah. that's what happens. Yeah. Um, if you say whatever you want to say, whenever you want to say it, you have to expect that there is going to be some sort of backlash. Mm. The only difference is now is the backlash is a slap on the wrist. The backlash isn't, right, that's it, you're released. Yeah. yeah. So the consequences of me speaking out are, they're less. Mm. That doesn't mean me speaking out is always the right thing to, to do. Okay. And that doesn't mean that everything I say is the right thing to say. I'm not, I, I would never even begin to, to, to believe that whatever I say is, is right is gospel, because it's not. Mm. Everyone has an opinion. Um, the only difference is now is that the punishment for speaking what's on my mind isn't as bad as the punishment would have been 10 years ago. So what more does the game have to do in terms of, you know, we've seen, everyone says that we've seen a rise this season, but, you know, we have Raheem Sterling, we have Mo Salah who's been in this situation, we have the situations at Millwall and Everton, Premier League, FA Cup, so, you know, the biggest grossing league in the world and the greatest domestic club competition in the world. But there's more than that, isn't there? You know, incidents happen up and down the country, grassroots, etc. How can the game bring all that together and challenge the very aspect of racism um, within all its quarters? There has to be some sort of plan put in place whereby education is great. Um, but on the other side of it, there has to also be some sort of punishment for when people do overstep the line. 
Um, is it going to be possible to wipe out 100% of racist remarks made during games um, by players, mm. from the crowd, from people sat at home watching the TV? No, it's not. Because you can't physically police it. Mm. But the times when things are reported, they, they, they have to, something has to happen. I mean, one of, my, one of my international teammates was sat at a game, I think it was Kettering, and he was sat there, and there was two people sat in front of him talking. And one of them said, oh, you can't just kick it over the back of them because them two coons will run all day. And then the other one sat next to him, turned around and laughed and went, we can still say coons, can't we? Jesus. In 2019, yeah. you, what? So this was reported. Okay. The person reported, my teammate reported it. He then got a handwritten letter from one of the two people saying, I'm sorry you had to hear that conversation. Um, it was a private conversation and um, you shouldn't have been listening. You shouldn't have been listening? Yes. Yeah. So, okay, that's not grassroots football, but if it's been reported, there's an admittance of guilt. Yeah. The club haven't banned the, the, mm. the, the fans. And then you get a handwritten letter saying, I'm sorry, that you shouldn't have been listening. It was a private conversation. It was nothing to do with you. Okay. I'm smiling at the ignorance. By so, so now we can be racist and we can be caught, but as long as we say sorry, it's all right. Mm. And then protect ourselves. <laughs> Embarrassing. Okay. Two more very quick ones as well, hopefully. The first one I've actually lost in my head because I've shaken my head at what you've just said. Um, we, we're going to have an audience um, that reflects the game on Tuesday. If you have a message for that audience that has current and past players, that has the authorities, that has policing units, that has referees, that has grassroots, grassroots people in there, what would that message be? about what we're going to talk about on the night, which will be led by your, your interview? We have to clamp down on it. Black players, white players, blue players, green players, whatever colour your skin is, we have to clamp down on it as players. The police have to be firmer. The referees have to deal with it. And every single person has to know if you are caught saying racist things, if you are seen doing, making, I don't know, making monkey noises mm -hmm. or, or doing whatever you might be doing and it's deemed racist, there has to be a punishment for that. You have to be nailed. Mm -hmm. Someone has to nail you and go, do you know what? That's unacceptable. You can't do that. Because without it, with, ah, you get banned from a stadium for a year, a couple of years, go to the away games. So what are we solving there? Mm. We're not solving anything.